dad uh, helped start the Assembly God Church up in Lead, and uh, he he drowned. And so I don't know. You know how families just kind of you know go by the wayside. But I remember somebody in our neighborhood inviting me to a vacation Bible school, and I can still sing Jesus Loves Me in Spanish. Cristo me ama, me ama me, por la Biblia, Biblia si. And, and I took that with me for a long time until my dad got saved when I was a teenager. And God changed things in a big way in our lives. And the wonderful thing about God is he's always, always working on our hearts. He's always working on our hearts. I, and I know we go through a lot of hard things. You know, in this church right now, we got people with medical issues. As you know, Cindy's eye, um, it's flared up again. And, and Mike's eye, you know, we, you guys, if one of you it was, it need to be the right eye and the left eye, and then you'd make a good pair. But, but just keep praying because, you know, we go through it with Christ and he conditions our heart. He conditions our heart. And uh, this weekend, just just praying for all of you, you know, a new life coming in here shortly. I was really surprised to see you this morning, guys. And uh, <laughs> you're coming anyway, okay. That's okay. I, I don't have my EMT license anymore, but we do have some medical people here. But, you know, God is so good to us, and he is conditioning our hearts every day. And uh, so this morning, the reason you're here is you just stopped in to see what condition your condition is in. You've heard that someplace, haven't you? I just stopped in to see what condition my condition was in. Go ahead, a little bit of trivia, anybody want to throw it at me? No, it was recorded in 1967. It was recorded before that by Jerry Lee Lewis, but he didn't bring it into the hit, the hit. The, the, the hit was the first edition in 1967. Anybody want to just toss out there who the lead singer was? You are going to be really surprised. Kenny Rogers. Everybody's like, what? Yes, Kenny Rogers and Glenn Campbell. Glenn Campbell played with the Beach Boys, and Kenny Rogers played with the first edition, who was their lead singer. And I have a special place in my heart for Kenny Rogers because he was also one of the few bass players in that day that sang. Yeah. Aren't you glad he went on to country? I mean, he, you know, he would have just, you know, into, because the first edition, I mean, they did okay, but man, Kenny Rogers, yeah, he killed it. You got to know when to fold him, you know? And, uh, and, and so it's kind of interesting because that song was, was written and recorded back in the 60s, and it was about a warning on do not use LSD. That's what the song was about. And I can remember, you know, listening to it back then and thinking, wow, huh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Huh? Because we're stopping in to see what condition you're, what condition is your heart in? You see, Americans spend a lot of money getting in good condition physically, you know, physically. In fact, the average American adult spends $155 a month on their health and fitness. I am not there unless you can put pizza and some little bit of fast food in there. But 150, that's an average, 155. Millennials are really spending a lot of money on their health and, and, and on healthy food and stuff. And that is an average of $112,000 over a lifetime. That's a lot of money. And that is to be commended. It really is. I, I'm not making light of that. I think it's great. You know, people are looking after their health. And it, it is great. But there's more to health than gym memberships and health supplements. And we take supplements and we exercise. But there's more than that. And we do something every morning before we do any of that. You see... It doesn't cost you a dime to do what I'm going to talk about. All it costs you is time. It don't cost you a dime, it just costs you time. T-I-M-E, time. We had, a, we had a tour guide one time, and he, he was a, a native of the area. He would take us and he'd ha have us eat edible plants. And he said, and the wonderful thing about this is it is free, F-R-E-E, -E, free. Well, this, 
All it takes is time, T-I-M-E, and it is free, F-R-E-E. <laughs> it's not going to cost you a whole lot, just time. To make sure that your mental health, your spiritual health, is healthy. Because you're going to check in every once in a while to see what condition your condition is in. And you need to check in with God. Negative mental health can have a huge effect on your physical health. In fact, just recently a study showed that poor mental health could lead up to a 67% increase in heart disease. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress out there. 67% mental health affects you that much. So the best way to have good mental health is to have good spiritual health. Because your spirit monitors what's going on in your mind. It monitors what's going on in your heart, in your, in your whole being. Proverbs 4.23, is, it rings out, the truth of it rings out, you know, decade after decade, century after century. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And if you've ever been in the mountains and you've drank that cold, fresh, pure spring water, yeah, you're just getting thirsty thinking about it, you know that, 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 that God knows what he's talking about here. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. And how do we do that? Well, the best, the best health trainers have a track record of healthy choices. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I usually, when, when I start looking for a doctor, and I've had to find a couple of new ones, I usually look for one that's a little healthy. I, I, I kind of like, hey, do you have any sports med doctors in your clinic? Because they tend to make healthy choices for themselves, and they tend to help you make healthy choices. I, um, my first doctor here in Spearfish, Dr. Gallier, sweet, sweet man, I think one of the best doctors this, this town's ever seen, had absolutely no bedside manner, but I didn't care. I wasn't, I, I wasn't going to him because I needed a good friend to, to you know, make me feel good. I needed a doctor to, to get me better. In fact, one time I was very unhealthy, and my weight was way up. I was eating way too many donuts. Yes, I was a police officer. And things were not looking good. And I went in for my checkup. And he says, so, uh, fat boy, you want to die? <laughs> good health trainers have healthy, healthy lives. And they make healthy choices themselves. And a great example of healthy choices to be found in the Bible, as far as our mental and our spiritual health is concerned, is Ruth, the book of Ruth. And I'm going to encourage you right now and at the end of this sermon, if I forget, go home this week and read the book of Ruth. It is an amazing story about, about sticking with God. It's an amazing love story, and I know that there's been made movies out of it, but I'm really disappointed that the Hallmark Channel hasn't grabbed onto this. They should make a modern Ruth. They really should. Because it is an amazing story of, of, of how a young lady held on to the most important thing in life. And we're going to look at it a little bit. You see, Ruth, if you, you go and you, you read the story of Ruth, she was a Moabite. What's a Moabite? A Moabite was basically not very liked by Israel. You, you read the Old Testament history. Israel and, and the Moabites, they lived close to each other, and they were always feuding, always fighting. It's kind of interesting. There's, 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 there's a few good things, a lot of bad things. So if you, you know, would, would say something to an Israelite, and especially back then about the Moabites, they don't really exist anymore. Israel would have said, okay, well, let's just, you know, let's just battle up. Let's get, with, let's get with it. Let's go take care of it. Where are they? Let's decimate them. And so she was a Moabite. She ended up married to, to a Hebrew man. And she was really seen as an enemy by, by most Hebrews. She experienced grief. As you know, her mother-in-law, Naomi, lost her husband. So she lost her father-in-law. She lost her husband, Ruth did, and she lost her, her, her brother-in-law. Three ladies, and they all lost their husband with no kids. And that was a big thing back then. No kids, no heirs. Who's going to get the family property, the property that was allocated to that family was going to be passed on to somebody else. It was, it was very, very important. So here's Naomi, no husband, two daughter-in-laws, no husbands, 
And she's going through all of this grief. And another thing that, that Ruth didn't always have is she didn't have real positive role models in her life. And we're going to look at that real quick. If you read through the story, you find that Naomi, once that her husband died, she was in kind of a blaming God phase. How many of you have ever blamed God for what's going on in your life? I mean, it's real easy to blame him, isn't it? Because number one, he's supposed to be in control of everything. And number two, usually he doesn't talk back audibly. If he ever does talk back audibly to you, you better listen, right? So we do. We all get in this blaming God phase. And, and Naomi, she was a kind of little, kind of negative Naomi. She really, you know, kind of went there. And so here's Ruth. She's got all this going on. You know, in, in Ruth, uh, Ruth 1, uh, verse 13, Naomi says to, to her two daughter-in-laws, No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. Well, that is really positive, isn't it? It's like, no, I know you've lost your husband, but it's worse for me. And so if I would have been, if I'd have been Ruth, and when Naomi said, No, you girls go back, to your families, uh, you know, to, to, to cut a fish and phrase, I would have cut bait and run. I would have, I was like, I don't need this in my life. I got enough negative stuff going on. You know, no, it's worth for me. So, 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 you know, but, but Ruth didn't. In fact, I mean, she was encouraged to give up and go home. In Ruth 1, verse 15, Naomi says, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. I mean, Naomi is doing about everything she could to get rid of her. She's like, I got enough going on. I don't need you tagging along. So you, you, just, you just take off and run. And you want to know something? We're all going to be there. We're all going to be to that place where, where people are going to see us as an enemy. We're going to be experiencing grief. We don't have the most positive people in our lives. We got a negative Ned or negative Nelly, excuse me if that's what your name is, a negative Naomi, okay? And, and things just might go that way. And sometimes people are going to encourage us just to get out of here, go on, leave, quit, stop. But Ruth found something more than the security of a husband. She found something you know, more than, than the comforts of family. And, and she found something more than, than just, just worldly encouragement. She found God. She found God. Somewhere along the line in her marriage, in her relationship, in this family, she did. And, and if you remember, <laughs> Naomi said, go back home and worship the gods of your people, little G. And Ruth said, no. Why would I do that? Somewhere along the line, God got a hold of her because she had an attitude that God could get a hold of. She had an attitude. She had grit. She, had, she, was, she was humble. She, had, she was thankful. She was loyal. And God's looking like, whoa, I don't care if she is a Moabite. He's probably thinking, I wish all of my, my Israelite children acted just like this. She's, she's amazing. And she said, no, I'm not going to give up. She found the one God, the only God, the God of the universe, and she got a hold of him with everything that she is. If we go to Ruth 1 and we read 16 and 17, Ruth replies to Naomi and she says this, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. She just, I could just see this young lady just... Don't you dare urge me. I could just see a little bit of attitude there. Don't you urge me to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. She's, she's saying to Ruth, it doesn't matter what's going to happen. It doesn't matter if, if we're living out in the open, if we're living in a barn, if, if, if the elements are pouring down us, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Now, it's kind of interesting because, because at this point in time, Ruth is actually speaking prophecy. She probably didn't even know it. She said, your people will be my people. Now, notice she didn't say, 
say, say, she said, your people will be my people. If you know some Bible history, you're going to find out something really cool about Ruth. Naomi's people did become her people in a huge way. She says, your people will be my people and your God, my God. So she's telling her, I found the God that I'm going to follow. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Ruth determined in her heart to stay the course with God and all that her journey with him would entail. Right there, she said, no, I'm in this for the long haul. Whatever happens, I'm here. Whatever happens, God is my God. Whatever happens, your people will be my people. Whatever happens, this is going to be. My husband may be dead, but I will stand by the covenant that I swore on that day to God and his family. The marriage covenant in, in, in the Hebrew culture was huge. Like I said, because that covenant of promise that God put over his people went on from generation to generation to generation and generation. When she married that Israelite, she became a Jew. By covenant relationship. And she said, I'm going to stand by this covenant. I'm not going to go marry somebody else because I'm standing by this covenant. I'm standing by it. And by, by Jewish law, because her husband was dead, she could have left. But she said, I'm standing by that. She said, life at this point hasn't been all that great. <laughs> I think she knew that. But here's what she did know, but God is. God is great. No matter what's going on, God is great. She said, I am committed to this relationship until one of us dies. <laughs> So, so here I am, and Naomi is like, whoa. And then not only does she tell Naomi that, she says, may God deal with me severely if I quit. And we know that the, book, the, the, the word of God says, don't just lightly use God as a covenant contract. Don't swear into something you can't do. She didn't. She said, look. May God deal with me ever so severely if I give up on you. And so she made this decision, and everybody lived happily ever after. Not yet. <laughs> as, as, as Paul Harvey used to say, and now the rest of the story. Because the rest of the story is this, that Ruth had even more obstacles to hurdle once she went back to, to Israel with Naomi. In, in Ruth... Chapter 2, 7 through 9, we find out that she had less social status there than a slave. Less social status, if you read through this. She worked in, in a dangerous environment. She worked long hours with no guarantee of gleaning enough to stay alive. She had all of this going on. She would go out and she would glean in the fields after they were harvested. It was a dangerous place for a woman to be. And, and if the harvesters, you know, wanted to be army, they just harvest practically anything. By Jewish law, they were supposed to leave something for the poor. But let's face it, people aren't always good people, are they? So she goes out to glean just so that she can provide a living for her and Naomi. And she didn't have hardly anything going for her, but the one thing that she did have going for her is she caught God's eye. Right? And she caught her future husband's eye, Boaz. Now, there's a lot of speculation about Boaz. Why an old rich guy wasn't married, and he wasn't that old by our standards, but by, by Israel, you know, Hebrew standards, yeah, you know, he, he was unmarried. And man, if you weren't married ooh, by your 20s, oh, what's wrong with you? Maybe he was fussy. Maybe he just didn't have an opportunity or anyone that he saw that, and maybe his standards were higher than most. I think they were. But she caught Boaz's eye. And in Ruth 2, 8 through 9, it says, So Boaz says to Ruth, he noticed her. 
My daughter, listen to me. Now, notice, he, he saw himself as a little bit older. He saw her as someone that, that was striving to do everything right, and he wanted to protect her. Listen, don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. My servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Her heart and attitude were what God noticed. Her heart and attitude was what Boaz noticed. She was, she was there with a servant's heart. She was there with loyalty. She was there with commitment. She was there with humility. She was there because she knew at this point in time that no matter what happened, God would take care of her. And even though she'd gone through a lot up to this point, she saw what God had done, not what she had lost. Not once in this, in this story do we hear her complain about, oh, you know, I'm uh, poor me, this and that. No. It's always, thank you for noticing me. Thank you for helping me. No, I'm going to be here no matter what. So I'm going to leave us with this. I want you to read the, the, the book of Ruth this week. I want you to read. I want you to look at Ruth's attitude. I want you to look at, at Ruth's heart. And then I want you to ask God to show you how he is moving in your life. The good stuff, the bad stuff, the easy stuff, the hard stuff. Say, okay, God, how are you moving in my life? Because Ruth and everything that, that happened, it's apparent that she really had a good grasp of God's goodness, no matter what. And sometimes I think when, when we're going through really, really hard stuff, and sometimes when we're going through really, really good times, we eh, tend to forget about God a little bit too and start thinking, well, I can do this. Look at me. Ha, you know. But, but ask God, Lord, how are you moving in my life? And then Take time to see how God is molding your heart. How he's molding your heart to have more of a heart like Ruth's was. Just take time and say, well, Lord, what I'm going through, am I allowing you to mold my heart or am I blaming you? <laughs> or am I blaming somebody else? You know, the blame game started... Right off the bat, uh, well, God, this lady that you gave me, she's the one that made me eat the fruit. It started a long, long time ago. And then not too long ago, you know, modern psychology is like, it was probably your parents' fault. Well, you know, how long can we blame our parents? Right? Or the neighbor, or our dog. It was my cat's fault. He woke me up this morning. So... So see how God is molding your heart. See, see that, that he's molding it in a, in a direction that, that brings him glory. And then ask God to give you the strength and the tenacity to have a heart like Ruth's. It takes strength and tenacity, and the only way we get that strength and tenacity is to go to God and ask the Holy Spirit to give it to us. Because it's not by might and it's not by, by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord. It's by my spirit that things get done, that things get done in us, that things get done in the world. God says, I want to come in. I want to make a home in you. I want to do something in you that, that builds a, a beautiful, wonderful, tenacious heart. But you got to ask me and you got to let me. So do that this week. And, and next week, we're going to look at a couple exercises that will help us with our heart conditioning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are here for us and with us. 
And Lord, there is, there's a lot of stuff. And Father, once again, we ask for healing, for supernatural healing. Lord, to touch eyes and throats and <laughs> parts of our body, Lord, that doctors are, are looking at. Father, just reach down and heal us. But in that process, Lord, give us a heart and a spirit that is as loyal and as tenacious as Ruth's. And help us, Lord, to, to do the exercises that we need to do to build that heart, to keep ourselves healthy, to keep ourselves, Lord, in that place that, that we can get out of bed every morning and say, yep, Lord, in you I can do this. We thank you, Lord, that you're with us. We praise you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.